thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I have to say it's a real pleasure to be in a meeting with real people, you know, and <laughs> you're not all virtual. Um, and also really enjoyed the presentations uh, throughout the day. I'm looking forward to the other talks. Um, it's been really a superb meeting. Uh, I've been given the informidable task of uh, presenting all the neurological, uh, acute neurological infections and their sequelae in 15 minutes or less. So uh, <laughs> if I sound like a chipmunk, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so let's see how far we can get. Um, so um, those of you who have not been to NIH intramural campus, it's close by. And those three buildings in front of you are, is the clinical center. It's called Building 10. That's where we bring in all our patients. And the advantage of that is that my office is right in the clinical center, and so is my lab there. So I don't have to get in a car to see the patients or collect the samples to bring them to the lab. <laughs> so uh, it's, a, it's been a great experience. Okay. Um, so, so I thought, okay, if we're going to cover all these infections, maybe there are certain things that are common to all viral infections. And that really is true. Um, so if you can broadly look at them, you'll say that, okay, if you look at the brain, you can cause an inflammatory syndrome that we call acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. And there's an MRI scan there showing um, just that. And you see these enhancing lesions. Um, actually, this thing does work. Yeah, there you go, except it's not that easy. All right. So uh, you can see those enhancing lesions there. Uh, within the brain. Uh, and then they can also affect the spinal cord, but they affect only the spinal cord. It will be called transverse myelitis. And to simplify them or oversimplify them, uh, these two are largely mediated by T cell mediated responses. Uh, you can affect the peripheral nerve uh, alone, and that uh, will lead to Guillain Barre syndrome, which is an acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. And most often it affects the motor nerves, although there are various variants of the syndrome that can affect other parts of the, uh, uh, of the peripheral nerves. And they're largely antibody mediated. And uh, then there's a rare condition called acute necrotizing hemorrhagic encephalopathy. It usually starts in the thalami, it's bilaterally symmetrical, and there's often blood associated with it. All those black spots you see there are blood. And that is largely cytokine mediated. So you can see that. Just the clinical recognition of these syndromes gives you an idea of the pathophysiology and gives you some hints as to what the treatment modalities should be. So for example, with Guillain-Barre syndrome, you give them IVIG or you do plasmapheresis and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, then what about specific uh, infections um, uh, or specific sequelae that are associated with each of these infections? And there's some viruses that will cause predominantly just uh, meningitis. We often call it aseptic meningitis, which just means you can't culture any bacteria out of it. Um, some will cause an encephalitis, and others may cause a myelitis. But often, if it's a viral myelitis, it will affect the anterior horn cells, and you end up with a flaccid myelitis. Okay? Well, if it's immune-mediated, it often affects the white, tra white matter tracts. Um, so, so then I thought, okay, let's classify all these viruses that will cause. So I'm going to focus only on encephalitis for the sake of time. And if you look at all the viruses that can cause encephalitis, here's a large list of them. And I've only listed the uh, large categories of viruses here. But what is most impressive is that you think the patient has a viral encephalitis. Everything looks like a viral encephalitis. But in majority of these patients, well, I mean, never find anything, you know. If you go to any tertiary care hospital on the inpatient service, they're sitting there. You have the attending of the month comes around and orders a whole bunch of tests. They never find anything. That person goes away. Next comes the next one. They order another whole bunch of tests. And most often, we never find them. So it's not entirely clear. Either we are missing these viruses, maybe they're present in the brain and we are looking at other places, or maybe the virus is gone and we're left with the aftermath of it with some immune activation. That part still remains largely unknown. OK, so are there specific clinical syndromes that can tell us what the virus might be? Every clinician will say, OK, I'm just going to go in there, look at this patient, and I'll tell you exactly what's causing their syndrome, right? That's your ultimate goal. Uh, not that simple, but 
and there are some clues. So for example, patients who have limbic encephalitis, most often it's caused by um, herpes uh, viruses uh, one and six. Uh, six most often in immune suppressed individuals. Okay. Uh, cerebellar syndromes can be associated with chickenpox virus, which is varicella zoster virus. It often occurs as a sequelae after you get chickenpox. So a few weeks later, child will present with cerebellar syndromes, and it's transient. It will last a few days or weeks and go away. And we think it's probably an immune-mediated phenomenon. Uh, Epstein-Barr virus can do the same thing. And then you have a couple of others. Similarly, there are some viruses that affect largely uh, the basal ganglia um, and can cause Parkinsonism. Some can cause a rhomboencephalitis, which means the rhomboencephalon is the hindbrain. Uh, and amongst them, I've listed listeria. Listeria is not a virus, it's a bacteria, but it often gets missed. So, um, uh, and I've uh, seen many physicians get sued for missing listeria, okay? Because they don't realize that uh, listeria can go from the gut along the vagus nerve all the way to the, uh, to the brain stem and present as an abscess or as a meningitis, and people miss that diagnosis. So I think that should be part of every patient that you has a rhomboid encephalitis, it should be considered. But then what about encephalomyelitis? And there you get the whole gamut. Almost everything under the sun can do that. So that doesn't really help you very much in differentiating your patients. Okay, so now what about arboviruses? So I've listed a whole bunch of them uh, here, and I'm going to pick on a couple that I think are very illustrative. Um, but, uh, you know, all these viruses circulate in various parts of the world. Um, some are more prevalent in certain areas versus the others, but they are the most uh, um, prevalent um, uh, infections that are causing encephalitis. Um, and dengue being the most common at the moment. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, Japanese encephalitis and West Nile uh, virus. Um, because they overlap a lot with one another, and, uh, and, and they're present throughout the world. So when we look at it, vast majority of the patients are really asymptomatic from the infection. So only a very small percentage of individuals develop encephalitis, but as you can see, the, even the name of the virus is Japanese encephalitis virus, right? Because the most devastating manifestation of the infection is really the encephalitis. So even though it's in a small percentage of individuals, that is what people are most fearful of. You're fearful of losing your ability to think and concentrate or behave in the way that you are, uh, or to be able to lose uh, other functions, uh, neurological functions. The clinical manifestations of these viruses, often they present with uh, meningitis. Um, there could be an altered mental status associated with seizures. Because I said they involve the basal ganglia, so you can see a variety of movement disorders, uh, and it can affect the uh, spinal cord as well. So if you look at the, the basal ganglia manifestations, I've listed a whole bunch of them, but depending on what part of the basal ganglia is involved, they can manifest in many different ways, and they're really of most interest to neurologists. We love trying to differentiate every little movement and classify them in different ways. Uh, but as you can see on the right-hand side on those MRI scans, there's a high signal intensity lesion in the thalami and also in the substantia nigra. So these areas are preferentially targeted by these viruses. Why that is the case still remains a mystery. Mm -hmm. Then as I said that um, when they affect the spinal cord, they love to go to the anterior horn cells. Right? Uh, a lot of viruses do. And, um, and so these patients present with a, a flaccid paralysis, and people have called it a poliomyelitis-like syndrome. Of, of course, this is not polio. Uh, often occurs in children uh, at a younger age, and, uh, and, the, uh, and it doesn't have to be symmetric, so it can very well be asymmetric. Um, another uh, interesting observation is that, and we see a fair bit of West Nile patients here, uh, um, that um, it will often affect the retina. In fact, a lot of uh, viruses will go to the eye, and it's not surprising because that really is an extension of the brain. And, uh, and that's something we miss quite often. We really need to look at the retina very carefully uh, 
because it can give you clues. And here are individuals who had West Nile virus infection and they had a severe retinopathy that wasn't really realized several years after their acute uh, episode. And then uh, this is another uh, arboviral infection, probably the most fulminant of all, and that is uh, Eastern equine encephalitis. And just yesterday, uh, it was reported that at least there are nine cases of Eastern equine encephalitis in, in Florida already. And so likely with the uh, mosquito season, uh, um, uh, you know, we are going to see more and more of these infections. And there's and with climate change, they're going to migrate uh, northwards. So you can see this child here. I uh, was uh, eight years of age, and you can see these fulminant lesions in the basal ganglia, as well as the gray matter within the brain. So these viruses love to target uh, neuronal populations. OK, and then uh, if any of these viruses can cross the placenta, uh, then depending on the age that they are able to do so, uh, they can affect the, uh, uh, the unborn child and certainly uh, the neurotrophic is going to affect neurogenesis. The classical of which is rubella, and as you know, rubella can cause a congenital syndrome and Zika causes something very similar. And as you know that in uh, South America, uh, this was a huge problem with congenital Zika syndrome and uh, the aftermath of which still exists. Right? And that is because it will infect the uh, progenitor cells. Uh, the other interesting thing was that with Zika, there was a, um, a huge number of Guillain-Barre syndrome patients. As I mentioned earlier, you can get a fair bit of Guillain-Barre with almost any infection, but here it was highly prevalent. So for whatever reason, it was leading to an immune-mediated phenomenon uh, resulting in Guillain-Barre syndrome, the pathophysiology of which still remains largely unknown. Uh, I had a chance to visit the Zika forest itself in Uganda, so I have that picture there, only to show you that the, the way they spell Zika has two eyes in it. And somehow the one eye got dropped and has been carried on since then. Okay. Um, what about uh, viruses transmitted by bats? Certainly um, SARS-CoV-2 is what brought these bats into picture. Now we worry about human-to-human -human transmission, but really it started from bats, right? And, but there's a whole host of viruses, as I've listed here, that can cause uh, pandemic proportions of infections, and they all get initiated from bats, and then they can be transmitted from humans to humans. You often wonder why is this in a symbiotic relationship with bats and humans? Why not mice and humans or some other mammal and humans? And the most likely explanation of that is that humans have probably lived in caves along with bats a lot longer than we have lived outside of caves. So in that period of time, we developed the symbiotic relationship between pathogens and humans. Yeah. Okay. So just as uh, Dr. Conti mentioned, uh, you know, these vascular phenomenon are very common with SARS-CoV-2, and that probably is a predominant neurological manifestation in these patients. It can manifest from minor microvascular stuff to large strokes bilaterally, microhemorrhages, or cerebral venous thrombosis. So any kind of vascular um, or coagulopathy uh, of sorts that can occur in these patients. Uh, there are a small subset of individuals I forgot to mention. Uh, let me see. I guess, uh, yeah, here it is. I can go back. That do die. So viral encephalitis is extremely rare uh, with the SARS-CoV-2. So we think largely everything is immune mediated and not necessarily a direct viral encephalitis. Almost nobody's ever isolated virus out of the spinal fluid, extremely rare. But there are some patients who undergo sudden death with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And it's not entirely clear, but a paper we published recently, we showed that there is pathology uh, in the brainstem and in involving the respiratory nuclei, which are called the pre-Bodzinger complex uh, within the medulla. And so for some reason, the virus targets that area within the brain. And then uh, what about Ebola? This is another infection transmitted by bats. And, um, and you know, it causes a cholera-like illness. And so early in the pandemic, everybody was focused on the GI manifestations. 
And I thought, oh, yeah, of course you're going to get neurological manifestations. It's all metabolic encephalopathy. And that's usually the modus operandus with almost any infection. You have AIDS came along first. We said, oh, yeah, of course you're going to get opportunistic infections in the brain. Uh, you know, SARS, the same thing. Ebola, same thing. And, but it t turns out that really the virus does target the brain. And there are primary manifestations of the brain that often get missed and not realized till much later in the pandemic. So uh, when I went to Liberia, there were about 50% of the cases really had meningoencephalitis. And that's what they were dying of. And uh, nobody's ever done an autopsy on these patients. We did bring some to NIH. And you can see some microvascular changes there on that MRI scan. And, these are, uh, and you can see in this uh, macaque model that there's a lot of vascular um, infection. So all that DAB staining is viral antigens. And there's resident uh, restrictor viral replication in the neurons themselves. Okay. Uh, what about enteroviruses? So as you know, the uh, um, uh, enterovirus D68 is circulating right now. There's a resurgence of that virus in the United States. And there's a lot of respiratory infection already ongoing. And our fear is that we're going to see uh, new cases of acute flaccid myelitis and manifesting this season. Uh, but uh, there are a whole host of enteroviruses uh, that can affect the, um, uh, the brain and spinal cord. Um, and, um, and of course, the most famous one, of course, is poliomyelitis. And uh, there is a post-polio syndrome that can occur many years later. And there's not a lot of pathology um, specimens available on that. But what is published shows that there's virus still present in the spinal cord decades later. And then you get inf inflammation around that area. So here are a few case, cases um, suggestive of that phenomenon. Uh, what about enterovirus 71? And um, so that causes this interesting, quite specific syndrome that can affect the, the um, uh, brain stem here. And as you can see, that beak-like um, uh, hyper-intense uh, signal on the T2-weighted images in the middle and hypo-intense of the T1 weighted measures is an area of necrosis uh, where uh, the virus specifically targets that area. Uh, but it can affect other parts of the spinal cord. And in immune-suppressed individuals, it can cause an encephalitis. Uh, what about herpes viruses? Um, and um, are we out of time already? Yeah. We got time? About okay. Minutes yeah. We have time? Just over two minutes, but we're we'll over two minutes. All right. Okay. Why don't I just stop yeah. here then? But, uh, uh, we'll uh, but just go to the end. Yeah. You all know about herpes encephalitis and CMV. And the last thing I wanted to say was EBV. And EBV has been associated with multiple sclerosis uh, uh, recently with some really interesting data uh, suggesting that uh, almost 100% of those individuals who developed MS in a prospective cohort were EBV infected. So I think that is quite fascinating. And uh, this is the hypothesis that it's um, maybe molecular mimicry. And HLA antigens are probably what determines it. And the new therapeutic, we don't have anti good antivirals. So really what we need is, uh, is other approaches uh, for it. And uh, our ability to use molecular ways of being able to target these viral genes and immune-mediated phenomenon uh, um, and methods to be able to enhance the immune system against the virus, I think is really the future for treatment of these patients. So I'll stop here. And if you missed the rest of my talk, uh, you can still available on this book. <laughs> OK. Thank you, Avi. That was that's fantastic. And any questions? We'll maybe take one question, and then we'll move on. Ask you, you mentioned that you know clinical encephalitis with acute SARS-CoV-2 is rare, which we see clinically as well, right? It's just very rare to see that as a presenting symptom. But I wondered how we you know reconcile the fact that there's a lack of detectable RNA in the CSF versus the fact that you know in the autopsy studies from the NIH things like that that there is you know SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA within brain tissues and not an insignificant number of people that that underwent biopsy, you know, even a couple months or a month or a few. Uh, after acute infection. And then the, the, the UK brain registry MRI study showing that there might be some kind of direct cytopathic effect up to the olfactory tract kind of up into the brain in this way. I mean, it, could this be preventing or, or circumventing the CSF and kind of traditional viral pathogenic or viral cytotoxic 
infections in the brain and kind of being directly in the parenchyma? Or what? Mm. We, obviously, for long COVID, this is okay. a huge question, right? So, so I just wanted to get your opinion yeah, on that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, certainly. It's quite possible that you can get virus uh, that can go from cell to cell and stay within the brain and never leak into the CSF. Uh, however, I'll challenge you to look at those papers very carefully that claim that there's virus in the brain. Really, there's very, very minuscule amounts in very few individuals. And it could either be contaminants or of little significance. I mean, there's a lot of virus. You know, you get EBV, CMV, all kinds of viruses you can find in the human body all over the place. We were infected as children. It stays there. It doesn't do any harm. So just because you find, you know, a couple pieces of RNA here and there doesn't mean anything. Uh, when we look at the brain, really we don't find any CD8 cells infiltrating there. Merely what you find is macrophage activation. In fact, we have a poster outside. I'd love to show that to you. And if there was viral infection in the brain, you'd find CD8 cells. We don't really find anything. If anything, you find they're around the blood vessels. And so I think all the pathology is really in the blood vessels and viral mediated stuff. In the parenchyma, it's all innate immune activation. Okay. And there's leakiness in the blood vessels. You'll get um, uh, fibrinogen, all kinds of blood products into the, into the uh, parenchyma. And then the macrophages come in. And they, once they get in, they don't leave. So you have persistent activated macrophages in the brain. We looked at the olfactory bulbs, exact same thing. You can see a lot of pathology in the olfactory bulbs, no virus. All the virus is present in the nasal mucosa. Mm. Lots of virus there, but not in the bulbs. Mm. 